was March 2021. My older brothers, one of them called and I answered, and then they looped me in on a three-way call and just told me, yeah, they said, man, Mark, Mark's dead. It was um, fentanyl. I woke up and went out the next morning, standing in that apartment, and I'm finding some, you know, drugs and paraphernalia, different stuff, feeling like, man, this is my older bro who I look up to, and I know he wouldn't want me seeing him in this light. But then I, I found a couple of journals. Um, I found a couple Bibles open, uh, devotional. My my brother um, wrestled with the Lord, the need for God's mercy and his overwhelming provision of mercy and kindness and goodness in the middle of that apartment. I think that's what's just what crashed over me. Every day we pass by people who have stories that need to be heard because we need to be shaped by them. This is one of those stories. Dave Goffney. Here we are. <laughs> Absolutely. I have looked forward to this day. You know, I uh, let somebody know the other day that I was going to be uh, interviewing you. And they said, you know what? Dave is one of the best leaders that we have in redemption. And uh, I think I have a tendency to agree with him. Oh, man. And so I just um, I appreciate you. Um, appreciate your story and your heart and what God has done, is doing, and will do with you. Mm. So thank you for making the run up here from Tucson. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thanks. How long have you been down in Tucson? Uh, my wife, my family and I, we moved back, uh, nine years ago. And so we, yeah, the church just celebrated seven years. I realized, um, earlier this year that unfortunately you and I have a, a commonality and that is that both of us have lost a brother to, um, an overdose. Mm Mm-hmm. And what was amazing to me was that, Dave, you have experienced a lot of loss. Hmm. And um, and not just a little bit. Um, growing up in, in your home, um, and your mother currently has dementia, and recently you lost your father, mm-hmm. um, and also your brother. And uh, that's that's a lot. And so I know just from the little bit of, of, of loss that I've had in my own life that uh, there's something powerful when we share the story of our family member. Hmm. And so today I wanted to give the opportunity to talk with you about your brother Mark. Hmm. And so I thought maybe first you can set us up just a little bit by telling us what kind of what kind of home you grew up in. Man, yeah, it's uh, I, I love talking about my fa- family for good or for bad. We, um, I think there's a lo- lot of pr- pride in our in our family. Kind of g- Goffany, Goffany pride. It's a hard name to say, especially with a stutter. Um, but um, it's it's one that we all kind of say with with pride and. Um, and it's uh, it was though also pretty broken. My dad left when I was about five months old, so my childhood um, was pretty broken. Home and um, there's a lot of love and and support, um, and again pride in our family. Uh, my dad was a big. He was in the military, then a police officer, then he was a construction worker. And uh, contrary to what you'd think from looking at me, he's actually a big guy. Um, and uh, he would always kiss us on the cheek, say, I, lo- I lo- lo- love you. Um, everyone in my family would always say, I lo- love you. Um, but yeah, definitely pretty broken. So yeah, my parents met pretty, um, pretty, mer- pretty kind of kind of crazily. Yeah. When you shared how they met, I'm like, I, I have never heard of a story like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a like Mamma Mia or some, you know, some movie that, you know, there, there could be a movie out of it. Um, my dad was in the Coast Guard and uh, through a series of poker games, both won and lost. 
ended him up in Spain um, in uh, about 1965 or so. And then my mom, who was from England, um, she survived World War II, was born while bombs were being dropped on, oh, wow. on England. And um, she ends up, you know, happens to end up in, in Spain. And my mom and dad met, and then she kind of called her job and quit. And they spent a year or so driving around Spain on a sc- scooter. And then they uh, they had my oldest brother move back here to the States. Uh, that was 1967. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, would have been 68 because my... No, it was 67 because my mom watched one of the first uh, Hooper Bowls, and she f- fell in love with the... Uh, American football and fruit fried chicken, um, all at the same, <laughs> all in the same same foul swoop. And then my brother Mark was born in uh, 1969, so there were no ultrasounds or or mm-hmm. or anything like that. So uh, Mark was born after you know what they thought was a you know quote unquote normal healthy pregnancy, and um, and then the nurse who saw him first kind of freaked out, and so they had to actually escort her out the room. Oh, of course, my mom's up, you know, wondering what's going on. Mark was born without arms. Um, and, uh, you know, they thankfully, just in God's wisdom, he was born to the right parents. My my parents, my mom especially, was great with him. Yeah. Uh, eight years later, my brother Joe, um, and then and then I, I came along. And then my parents actually, um, my dad left when I was about five months old. So I don't have many memories of kind of the whole family there all together. Talking about... Uh, your brother Mark, just just jumping into his story, what was some of your earliest memories of growing up with a brother who had special needs? Wow, that's a that's a great question. I didn't expect. Um, I think it was again pride, um, and uh, yeah, he was. I it's weird. I I mean, he changed my diapers with his feet, you know. So I didn't. Yeah, that's that's hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah, right yeah, there. yeah. You don't need to picture it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> my first memories of him are just as an older brother I looked up to and lo- loved. Mark specifically, he would take me to school. Actually, so this is kind of part of again the God's goodness, even in um, a broken family and stuff. Yeah. So my mom had to support us, and she went out early in the morning, got back late at night. Um, so to get this little five-year-old off to kindergarten was my brother, Mark, who had, was in and out of high school at the time. Mm -hmm. He would take me on a skateboard to school to catch the, or to the bus stop where I would then take the bus to, to school. And, uh, so yeah, here you got my armless brother on a skateboard, you know, with me on the front and we'd hit a rock and crash and tumble. We ate it, um, you know, (laughs) top lower. So you got a little guy with a stutter and a guy with no arms tumbling <laughs> over him um so i i looked up to him a ton i mean all my older brothers but he definitely was one that we were we were we were close did he have any faith at mm. this point and you know what did that what did that kind of look like yeah yeah um yeah he for sure had a faith had a, a dynamic personal faith early on um it would have been so. I think he was really how the Lord broke into our 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 family. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I, I would have been five or six years old, so he was probably fifteen or sixteen. Um, he was the first one. Uh, there was a, a small charismatic church in yeah. met in the in the high school that he had gotten kicked out of, um, and then they had a they had like a, a midweek Bible st- study, and um, that's where he he came to faith. I think navigating the tension of being a follower of Jesus, putting his faith in Christ and drug use and different things, just growing up in a broken home in a broken neighborhood, um, that was always kind of a part of his 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 long life. Um, he did have seasons that were longer. So he had come to faith in Christ. He would like play in his worship team at church at Calvary Chapel, or he'd do he'd, he'd play and he and he's playing the guitar. Yeah, yep, yeah, with yeah, his feet. With his feet, yeah, yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I forget that people don't all know that. Yeah, he picked it up when he was like, again, young, nine or ten. Uh, my dad actually found one on the job site um, at about when my brother was about nine or so, and he brought the guitar home, and then. Uh, my 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 brother learned how to play the guitar, taught himself, and yeah, begun begun playing uh, playing the guitar, and that ultimately would be the primary 
source of income for throughout the course I of mean, his entire life. So I mean, he was that good that he legitimately that was his his way of earning a living. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. remarkable. Mm-hmm. That's, and I'm sure you have footage uh, of him playing somewhere. And yeah, I mean, it's all I over you, you, YouTube. You type in Mark Goffany or just Armless Guitar or whatever. You know, yeah. you'll yeah, you'll get a lot. Yeah. You talked about him in and out of high school a little bit, or however that was. What kind of what's what was Mark's life trajectory? Yeah, um, he he probably had a chip on his shoulder. Hmm. Um, I think like I we joked um, actually at his memorial service that you know that um, you know what what would make a guy with no arms start playing the guitar for a living than a guy with a stutter be a creature, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think some of that for him definitely was um, he was kind of proving the world wrong. Um, he was also kind of thrust into the public eye. And was somewhat of a childhood celebrity, so he, hmm. he he hosted a lot of like shows and foam hazing efforts, things like March of Dimes and mm-hmm. you know things like that. Um, he was kind of their poster boy, and so he would uh, he would he would do. Um, a bunch of things and get all kinds of fame and then like telethons and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Telethons, uh commercials. He'd host the t- t- telethons, which um, you know, people we might remember. So people like Magic Johnson, I mean everyone knows I him. And, Magic Johnson. And he'd go there and he'd do all that and he'd get all these attaboys and raise millions of dollars and people would just tell him how great he was. Um and then he'd come home, you know, to our kind of house in, you know, working class, working poor neighborhood, East County, San Diego. No one was kind of keeping him propped up there. And and so, I mean, he probably started to use around 10 or 11 years old, around the time my dad left. And even as you ask about my first understanding of his drug use, I think that came pretty, pretty early on. I mean, I remember as a young kid, him coming home and my mom my mom's demeanor or posture changing and her looking at him in the eyes and being like, y- you're stoned, aren't you? And he'd be like, no, no. And, oh, I just jumped in the p- pool. It's chlorine. And, yeah. you know, so kids, if you're listening, those jokes are <laughs> way old. Don't use them. Or those excuses. No, but then, I mean, she she c- caught him a couple times because we were always there. And she he got he got caught. And then he started to, started to deal drugs out of our house and... Our, our actually our home got broken into a lot um uh and we got a lot of our kind of stuff you know stolen and so i think pretty early on i picked up it was connected with mark's mark's drug use about what age were you when you realized that your brother had an addiction um probably about 5 or 6 so an, ear- an right. early memory yeah definitely an early memory um yeah yeah we found a bong a giant bong um, in, uh, in the backyard and my mom brought, so my older brother, Joe, just older than me, we got home with, you know, we were like five and seven and, uh, and we ran out back and my brother, Mark tried to catch us, man, I wish he, he could tell the story so well, <laughs> but, uh, we ran around and my mom was like, Oh, I bet they're smoking pot, you know? And we went, we went little, little punks, right? We sold out yeah. my brother, but <laughs> we found this like six foot purple bong, and uh, and one of his, and my mom's like, "Whose is this?" And and uh, no one would answer, so she broke it. And then one of the guys was like, "Oh!" And and uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I remember that. You know, I remember those kinds of scenes. Um, so did Mark have severe drug use his whole life, or did he have moments of sobriety? What did that What did that look like? And with that, kind of, how did? Because I know faith was in there with him too. Mm-hmm. How did that kind of? correlate to all of this yeah man even as you ask the question i'm 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 um i'm just humbled and even a little bit convicted by how neatly compartmentalized i tend to want to keep things Mm -hmm. and just how that's not not (laughs) real and that's certainly not been my family's um so the same older brother who you could say it's his fault our house is getting broken into it's through him that the Lord really broke into my into my family, and then shortly after that, it, I did. I don't really remember, even though growing up in the house, I did. I, I remembered walking with Jesus really early on, um, and it was through through him, through my older br- br- yeah. brother's influence. And yeah. he would, 
I don't know the specifics of how long and when, but I know he had a season where he was really walking with the Lord again, drug dealers coming over to our house, upset that he was no longer going to yeah. deal. You know, here he's taking a stance for his faith, you know, standing toe to toe with drug dealers when he was probably 15 or 16. Um, and then he went into rehab and it was um for most of his life he did have a long run he you know he had a 13 year span where he was clean and sober um but then he was a single dad and so for that whole 13 years he he took it on himself and said I'm going to I'm going to and I'm going to provide for my family and, and, and yeah he, he didn't didn't do any drugs so let's jump to that day hmm. not too distant past in which you get a phone call and walk us through the day in which you hear that your brother has passed away man yeah it was march um i think it was march 2nd 2020 so um no 2021 yeah so yeah not even a year um everything bad gets blamed on 2020 (laughs) (laughs) We can blame 2020. Yeah. No, I, uh, yeah, it was March 2nd. I actually just had a hard conversation within our church um, a couple hours before. Honestly, I thought that was for sure going to be the hardest thing I walked through, at least for a few months. Um, it was very difficult. And then two hours after I got the call, and actually my older brothers, um, two of them called me at different times, and sometimes they'll accidentally dial me. I just, right. honestly, I ignored or I just, I didn't kind of jump right to it. I was eating dinner with my family. And then I finally, they, they, one of them called and I answered. And then they looped me in on a three-way call and just told me, you know, they said, man, Mark, Mark, Mark's dead. And, uh, and then shortly after I found out my sister-in-law who they'd been separated for like 20 some years, but they were best friends and uh, they 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 died together, and she was a huge, also a huge part of my life and my faith. And uh, yeah, they died to g- together from um, drug drug use. It was um, fentanyl. I oh, yeah. waited, but so you end up standing in the house in which your brother and your sister in law died. What's kind of you had mentioned? the different objects that you found in there and kind of the the juxtaposition and the symbolism of the battle. Mm-hmm. What was it that you saw in the house? Yeah. So I, 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 I left the day after I found out. I mean, that was late at night. So I woke up and went out the next morning. And um, I think it was an incredible privilege. I got to be the next person in the apartment um, after my after my older brother and sister-in-law were, were taken out by the medical examiner, um, I was the next one in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, which I was kind of surprised by with some of the stuff that I found in there that the police and, you know, what they did all their examination, and everything. And then here I am, I'm in there. And um, I don't want to get into all the d- sure. details, just, sure. I mean, probably even just for people yep. won't watching, but um, it was, it was bad. It was, it was very bad. Um, the, the smell was horrible mm-hmm. and I'm standing in there and I'm finding some, you know, drugs and paraphernalia, different stuff that, um, and even just feeling like, man, this is my older bro who I look up to and I know he wouldn't want me seeing him in this light. Um, but then I, I found a couple of journals. Um, I found a couple b- b- Bibles open, uh, devotional. And just again, the, the messiness of seeing, man, these people, my, my brother, um, r- r- wrestled with the Lord and walked with yeah. the Lord. And, uh, and my sister-in-law, um, loved the Lord and trusted him, um, isn't that interesting because a lot of people find that hard to understand. Yeah. Right? It's like how can your brother love Jesus and bow down to the idol of addiction? Man. You know, how can he say that he believes in this and yet wrestles with that? But don't we all wrestle with things that we don't lay down like we should? Man. And and that whole notion of you will see your brother again. Mm. I, I will see my brother who 
the week before he overdosed and died, were talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what's true for your brother and my brother is neither one of them understood the access that they had to the resurrection power of Jesus. Man, that's so good. I mean, even as we, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in room right now. This, this week, we're, we're going to be in John 14 verses one through fourteen, and you know, where Jesus says, "Do not be troubled, but believe in God and believe also in me." And then in, in verse six, he says, "You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me." And uh, the reality of um, man, my brother knew intellectually, just like I so often know intellectually, the re- re- resurrection power of Jesus. But to actually embody and press into and 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 cling to, um, moment by moment, day by day, that Jesus truly is the way, not just the way to eternal life, yeah. not the get out of hell free card. But that he is the way. He's he's the way to the Father. He's the way to reconciliation and the way of life, where life is found. And the fact that my brother at times and in moments believed that, but that certainly in those last moments, he it didn't he didn't embody it. Um maybe he he turned away from it. Um earlier I was sharing with you about some hard conversations I had within the last couple weeks mm-hmm. and how I find my tendency is t- to harden up, you know. Earlier at the beginning, you talked about how I'm, I, I how I've kind of have grit or resilience or have you know mm-hmm. endured hardship. And um, I, I think at times I, I've learned some bad habits, though. To in my case, it's to hmm. harden up, to let to kind of be like, man, you're not going to fool me. I'm not going to get, you know, um, to kind of push a motion down and uh, and to not look at pain and. I think for others, maybe in, in our context, probably a mm-hmm. lot of people, we do over-intellectualize. We th- theologize because mm-hmm. it feels neater and cleaner. I think if we're honest, we we kind of keep God in a box and he's safer there than, um, than entering into the messiness of people like David and, and Noah, um, Peter, you know, um, Rahab, Mary, you know, who are, it's just messy. And, 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 um, on the way to San Diego, Tyler Johnson, I, um, called me and he reminded me of a, of a book, um, the mercy prayer by Robert Jelinas, where, um, he says in this, it's, he said, it, it goes like this, Lord have mercy for those who sin and for those who suffer. For those who suffer because of sin and for those who sin to alleviate their suffering, Lord have mercy. And in and, and standing... That is good. Yeah, man. We uh, Standing in that apartment, I, I think the reality of God's goodness, and for me, I mean, I kind of had to cry uncle. I couldn't, couldn't keep fighting. I couldn't just think my way through it or, again, theologize and... Um, the 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 richness and the the need for God's mercy and His overwhelming provision of mercy and kindness and goodness. Um, that's, that's so good, Dave. In the middle of that apartment, I think that's what's just what crashed over me. So, when you think of your brother's life, what is the legacy? That he left. Uh, my last conversation with him in person, it was right after our dad died. Um, we were out there and he was already had fallen back off the wagon. And, and I was actually going to leave with my family a d- day early just because my my broader family's just m- messiness was, was heavy and was hard. Right before I left, I was talking with my brother, Mark, and he was smoking a cigarette, and you had to know him to. He kind of look at you side. He kind of talk sideways. And again, picture someone he's not that tall, a little bit taller than me, with no arms, but like walked around like he was seven feet tall. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, he's like, hey man, I'm pr- proud of you, Dave. And uh, and then he just said, you know, you you have your boundaries up, and um, and that's good. That's good. And and I think you should. You're smart, you know, to do that. And uh, and I'm proud of you. And 
But even as you ask the question, what keeps coming back though too is, um, as I said earlier, just rawness, real. He's very real. He did not hide his his addictions. Um, you know, he was he wasn't living duplicitous life yeah. um, like a lot of people do, like a lot of us, like a lot of weed, you know, Christians do, and certainly alcoholics and addicts I know as well. He he was pretty out there. He was just pretty like, hey, it's kind of I you you see what you get. Um, but when I, I also it's uh, um. I think what breaks my heart is though that I still feel like he left so much on the table. Man, he just he was such a gift to me, to uh, my family, to his family, to just to the world. I mean, man, again, just living out the reality of faith and all the stuff he'd walked through and been through, and yeah. and then to to go out like that. That breaks my heart. Well, you're familiar with Rascal Flats, maybe the country song or the country group. They have a song um, entitled "Why," hmm. and it's about suicide. And the way that they say it is, um, "Why did you leave the stage in the middle of your song?" Wow. And that lyric is just so powerful. Thinking of those who lost people too quickly. You know, you said that your brother stated that he was proud of you Hmm. and there's no doubt that he was david i appreciate your heart Hmm. for the least the last and the lost i love how you have allowed pain to shape you how loss hasn't crushed your soul it may have jumped on your shoulders pretty good but the spirit hasn't allowed you to be broken Amen. and your faithfulness. And I hope that it will continue to shape you more like Jesus. And you serve as a reminder to me to keep leaning in to the people who are in hard places, to the people who are messy. And uh, Dave, you're a good guy. Amen. And it's a pleasure to call you a friend and an honor. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Praise God. Just as you say, he's uh, his 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 relentless pursuit. Um, I just can't can't make sense of. It's humbling. It's fru- frustrating at times, saddening. But man, even as you say that, I just uh, I'm just so thankful for Jesus's again relentless commitment to 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 be with us and even bring us. Uh, into into the hard spaces that he's in. And you're in a hard space because you're in Tucson. <laughs> That's it, man. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Hey, thank you, man. <laughs>